This is an introduction into the use of basic diagnostic equipment, which can be commonly found in the clinical setting. For the examination of the cardiovascular system, I shall describe the use of the stethoscope and this sphygmo manometer. Let us consider some general advice. Ensure that you are familiar and competent in the use of the diagnostic equipment before examining the patient. Check that all your equipment is functioning properly and that you have the necessary spare or disposable components. Ensure that the equipment is clean and disposable components are changed the moment you finish examining the patient. Let us now look at the stethoscope. This is a simple device made up of a chest piece, a hollow plastic tube and two earpieces. The chest piece is what you use to pick up the sounds and it is usually double-sided, made up of a diaphragm and a bell. The sounds from the chest piece are transmitted via the hollow tubing to the headpieces. The end of the headpieces are connected to two soft ear tips which can be removed for cleaning or replacing. Place the headpiece over the ears, ensuring that the ear tips are facing slightly forward. If the chest piece is double-sided, you need to ensure that you have turned the chest piece so that the open hole is connected to the side you will be applying on the patient, i.e. the diaphragm or the bell. Holding the chest piece in your hand for a few moments helps to warm up the metal components before touching the patient's skin. The stethoscope should be applied with gentle pressure but sufficient enough to form a seal with the skin. The diaphragm is better suited for picking up high-frequency sounds like S1 and S2 cardiac sounds, friction rubs from the pericardium, or the murmurs from mitral and aortic regurgitation. The bell will pick up low-frequency sounds better such as S3 and S4 heart sounds or cardiac murmurs from mitral stenosis. Applying heavy pressure will alter the frequency of sounds perceived. If the bell is applied with heavy pressure, it will cause the skin underneath to become stretched, thus acting like the diaphragm. The bell is also better suited for those who have a hairy chest. Let us now describe the sphemomanometer. There are three basic types of sphemomanometers. There is the old style mercury, the aneroid and electronic ones. The mercury sphemonometer is made up of a vertical column of mercury, which is the manometer, connected with a tube to a cuff. The cuff contains an inflatable bladder, which is connected to two tubes, one which sends the pressure to the manometer, and the other which is connected to a pump. To pump up the cuff, you need to close the valve. The aneroid is made up of a dial instead of a mercury column with the rest of the components similar to the mercury type. Both types of sphix need to be checked periodically to ensure that they remain calibrated. There are several sizes of cuffs. There is a standard cuff for the average adult arm, a large cuff for big arms, a cuff for thigh blood pressure measurements and small ones for children and infants. You need to check that you are using the appropriate size cuff for that arm, otherwise the blood pressure measurements will be inaccurate. If you use a cuff which is too small for that patient's arm, it will give you a falsely high reading. Ensure that the patient's arm is free of all clothing and that it is comfortably resting supinated on a desk, tucked under your arm or by their side if they are lying down. Ideally, their arm should be at the same level as their heart. Position the cuff at about 2.5 cm above the antecubital crease. Students should practice by pumping at the cuff and feeling for the radial pulsations until they disappear. 
note the level of mercury at which the pulsations are no longer felt. Then deflate the cuff and wait for 30 seconds and then start again. Position the stethoscope's headpiece in your ears and place the bell over the brachial artery. Pump up the cuff at a level of about 10 to 20 millimeters above that which you noted before. Start deflating the cuff very gently until the first sounds are heard. As the blood starts to push through the deflating cuff, the turbulent blood flow produces the Korotkov sounds followed by the systolic sounds. At this point, you need to note the systolic pressure. Continue deflating until the sounds gradually disappear. At the level when nothing can be heard, you note the diastolic pressure. The blood pressure is recorded as systolic over diastolic, such as 120 over 80.